Welcome everybody, uh, both here in person and uh, on Zoom today. Uh, it is my uh, special privilege and uh, joy really to introduce my good friend and colleague, uh, Antoine Dwayhi, uh, who is joining us today from uh, Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, to talk to us about uh, racial and social inequities in substance use uh, disorders. Uh, uh, Antoine is a professor of psychiatry and medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, he has uh, dedicated his uh, career really uh, uh, to this uh, idea of um, um, this, uh, substance use disorders, uh, both in terms of educating, um, uh, the next generation of providers, uh, but also uh, the uh, community in terms of reducing stigma um, and um, uh, minimizing uh, inequities uh, in care. Uh, you will hear more about this uh, directly from Antoine. Uh, just want to say that uh, uh, Dr. Dwayne, he has um, a long list of uh, honors and a um, long list of publications, uh, both in terms of uh, um, uh, articles uh, in journals, as well as several books that he has published over the years. I will not uh, be going over um, all these for the sake of time today, but I will uh, turn the uh, microphone directly to uh, uh, Antoine, to Dr. Duwayhi for, for his talk today. I wanna say that, uh, um, uh, I heard from uh, Dr. Dwayne that there will be uh, ample time at the end of this uh, uh, presentation today for Q and A's for conversations, but also um, maybe if we have time to hear directly from him uh, how they went about uh, starting the new uh, starting a fellowship program at uh, Pittsburgh, especially that our department is considering starting a fellowship program in addiction psychiatry as well. So that's a topic uh, that is uh, of special interest uh, to us uh, here in Rochester. Antoine, welcome. Thank you so much, George. I really appreciate it. And it's so great to see you on Zoom and hope to see you soon, uh, you know, in Rochester or even here in, in uh, Pittsburgh. All right. Okay, well, uh, thank you for joining us today. You know, I, uh, as George mentioned, you know, I wanna make sure that there's a lot to cover here when it comes to the topic of the racial and uh, social inequities and substance use disorders. But I would like to really, you know, uh, uh, give enough time for any reflections or questions, you know, so we can have a little bit of a discussion you know, for um, for at least if we can do like 10, 15 minutes of that. Uh, okay, so this is the scope of my work. You know, George has really kind of, uh, in a way, uh, 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 gave you some, uh, some idea, you know, but I've been in the field of addiction for 25 years now. And I'll tell you my experiences, you know, when it comes to working with patients and families, as well as, uh, uh, collaborating with community uh, uh, activists, providers, you know, as well as doing a lot of the clinical research and, and as well as uh, being involved in a lot of the advocacy and the public health policies uh, in the Department of Health, you know, in Pennsylvania here. And uh, it's been a great experience for me and I, I wouldn't have chosen basically a different career. You know, it's, uh, uh, despite the challenges and uh, a lot of the uh, uh, really issues that do we deal with in the field of addiction. And as you know, the field of addiction has really evolved from all aspects over the past 40 years. And uh, we're doing definitely much better in terms of providing uh, uh, treatment as well as addressing inequities, you know, particularly the racial ones. And, uh, but we still have a lot of work to do in that context and uh, uh and we still see a lot of these inequities that as you noticed uh, during the uh the uh, uh covid 19 pandemic which is still 
kind of on some level is going on is that you know they uh, uh, these inequities were very very much exposed you know more and more so which indicates that how much it's important for us to keep doing the work that we need to do from an advocacy point of view and uh, engagement in uh, really advocating for uh, policies that are anti-racist and uh, addressing inequities and uh, as well as doing more clinical research and really also engaging in training, training uh, future generations of physicians, as well as uh, psychiatrists, you know, all across health, healthcare uh, practitioners. And I'm talking about nurse, uh, nursing and pharmacy and, you know, all uh, health sciences. So these are the learning objectives that, uh, so the, the bottom line here, I'm gonna give you the context of really what the problem is and uh, uh, what we define as really racial inequities in substance use disorders. And then we'll talk about how we got here in a sense, you know, what are the drug policies that have been affecting the treatment of substance use disorders and fueling these inequities over the course of the years and goes back decades in a way. And then uh, we'll uh, discuss what can we do about it? So this is in a, in a nutshell what we will be discussing here today. The first, you know, definitions and context here, you know, as, as you know, we, we talk a lot about in academia, whether academic medicine or even psychiatry, we debate all the time disparities in treatments and outcomes without really kind of, in a sense, uh, uh, seeing the importance and the relevant social determinants of health, which is really uh, 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 including racism. Uh, now we are more aware of it. We have, uh, it's been more in the, on the front line, let's put it this way, but we still have a tendency to really, in a way, uh, dismiss it on some level or because of our own biases, you know, implicit and explicit biases, you know, that we have a tendency to really push it aside and not really, uh, you know, take it into consideration when we are uh, uh, looking at disparities and what we could do about it. So this Kamara Jones, Dr. Kamara Jones defined racism, and I want to really put it in, a, in a, as simplistic way as I could, you know, this is, it's defined as a system, as a structural system that, uh, um, that assigns values based on phenotype, the race we talk about, or the way people look. And definitely what ends up leading up to, which when we talk about social determinants of health, to unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities, we're talking about uh, people of color here, but also advantages, it, it creates some advantages for other communities too. And also what ends up happening as a result of that, as the outcome of that is, it undermines the realizations of the full potential of the whole society through wasting basically the human resources that can obviously address you know, the racism. So when you talk about structural racism, along with uh, white supremacy, class uh, oppression, or gender discriminations, we know very well that it, it, and we've seen it, we've experienced it, whether in academic center and community centers, in our society, in our communities, everywhere. You know, uh, uh, it leads to this power and wealth imbalance across many of the systems, systems that govern our lives. And we're talking about, you know, a lot of them are really part of the social determinants of health. We're talking about housing policies, educational systems, talk about voting rights, you talk about labor markets, criminal justice system, which is a huge problem. So here, just to give you an idea about uh, really the health uh, inequities, you know, and uh, this is really defined by the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. And as you can see here, the structural inequities and in, around basically, and the biases happen around all these kind of uh, uh, aspects of the social determinants of health, whether community-driven, basically, uh, uh, you know, for example, do you have here the public safety, the social environment, transportation, education, employment, uh, uh, income and wealth, uh, uh, the, the physical environment, housing, you know, health uh, systems and services. And the structural inequities happen all across basically these social determinants. And we're talking about the drivers and the, let's put it this way, like moderators and mediators of, of these uh, issues are really socioeconomic as well as really political. And I will get into more details about that. 
So, you know, a few words about race, about stigma that I want to, before I move on to talk about the racial inequities and, and we need to really see it in that kind of a context of really stigma that is really very much intertwined with the discussion about racial inequities. And uh, as you know, when we're ref what we're referring to when it comes to stigma, we're talking about really the negative stereotypes, judgment that prejudice can lead, that can lead to discrimination. So uh, uh, one example, for example, with the stereotype or really generalized belief that people with psychiatric illness or substance use disorders, you know, are really violent, you know, that generalization of really these beliefs. And this leads to prejudice or a judgment based on belief, well, they are really violent, they are aggressive, I'm scared, I don't want to really deal with them, I don't want to work with them, I don't want to really provide them with the resources that they need. And this leads, in fact, to the, can result in the discrimination, which is an action based off of those judgment and belief. Like I wouldn't really uh, uh, hire somebody who has this, uh, a psychiatric disorder or substance use problem. And as you know very well, a lot of uh, patients with mental illnesses as well as substance use disorders, you know, they, uh, uh, they do not have any, they have very uh, uh, limited opportunities when it comes to, for example, employment, housing issues, you know, and because of really uh, a legal history that they have. Uh, 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 so again, this, the stigma results from fear and can lead to avoidance. See here, you know, from negative stereotypes to judgment and to prejudice. So what is the far reaching really harm of the stigma and what we're really talking about, which has been experienced uh, uh, significantly among uh, really people of color and in the context of also pro practitioners who are really uh, providing really treatment. So you see here, uh, you see all these kind of really intertwined really uh, uh, um, social determinants that I've discussed before that are really affected by the stigma. And uh, on top, I talk about the age, gender, race, and ethnicity, illness, the illness itself, substance use disorders, for example, or mental, uh, you know, psychiatric disorders. And as you see, you know, all kind of really, in a way, converge into the uh, mental health stigma, and, and that has ramifications when it comes to mental and physical health care, employment, housing, relationships, as well as self-perception that can really be more a kind of a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. And uh, since a lot of people, when they feel very much stigmatized, they internalize it and they really kind of uh, distance themselves from even advocating for themselves and being really assertive. So uh, stigma is a social construction. Uh, when, you, when you think about it, it's definitely influenced by socially important categories, such as culture and ethnicity. And, uh, and we know very well also cultural norms and perceptions, they do determine social indicators of psychiatric disorders, well as substance use disorders, thereby impacting stigmatizing cues. And this is the impact of stigma. Just this is, uh, again, we can go on and on about that, but, but two things I wanna really point out to you here is that the impact on treatment seeking, when people have been really stigmatized, you know, and they are not gonna really seek treatment, you know, that they are gonna really kind of less involved in reaching out and utilizing any resources, you know, and the treatment delivery. So the practitioners who have been also very much stigmatizing the patients, whether intentionally or unintentionally, you know, they are less likely to engage them in treatment and providing them the resources they really need. And one word also here about language. Language is huge. It's, it's, language can really basically, the context of substance use disorders and psychiatric disorders can be obviously, as you know, very stigmatizing and very, uh, 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 very destructive. You know, and uh, there have been more and more studies basically that uh, determined that uh, uh, a lot of basically even the documentation that has been noticed in, in terms of uh, uh, you know, working with patients with substance use disorders and psychiatric disorders, and even uh, in general medical illnesses, you know, there is a lot of stigmatizing language that is even is documented in, in the records. And, and, and we know very well that the stigmatizing language can have negative outcomes when it uh, in, comes to treatment. It's just this is really kind of, uh, wanna give you a little bit here on the slide, 
a, a very interesting website. It's called a dictionary that uh, talks about really the dialects, the recovery dialects. You know what what you could really use differently to uh, uh, to really approach uh, patients who are really struggling. For example, we we tend to really kind of sometimes use uh, the word the patient relapsed. You know, and and we have a, a tendency to really kind of by by using the word relapse, you know, we're basically, in fact, accusing people, you know, of doing something that they wanted to do really intentionally, in a sense, which we know very well, when people decide about using or something, it is a choice, but still, the language can be very detrimental, you know, to the uh, uh, to treatment and to engagement in treatment, as well as retention and treatment. For example, instead of using real patients started using again. And uh, so again, you, you change the way you approach it, you know, I know we've used a lot of that medication assisted treatment when it comes to opioid use disorders or alcohol use disorders. We're moving now towards really basically medications for opioid use disorder, medications for alcohol use disorders, you know, because there is no such thing as medication assisted. You don't have that basically for diabetes or asthma or, uh, or hypertension or any uh, medical illnesses. So this would really give you a little bit of a sense about the importance of really the language that we use. So the scope of a problem, moving on now to really the, uh, the uh, 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 you know, the racial uh, inequities that we see. And one of the things that I wanna mention before I move on here is that how also the stigma and, and COVID-19 uh, pandemic have been really also fueling also these racial inequities and exacerbating a lot of the economic stress, obviously, uh, uh, and uh, intensifying the and uh, leading up to intensifying and leading up to patients uh, struggling more and more, whether with uh, coping with their psychiatric illness, and uh, even worsening worsening of the substance use. We have uh, definitely more uh, 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 barriers that have been created as a result of the uh, pandemic. And, uh, and the stigma was worsened. We have noticed it for already vulnerable groups. I'm talking about really people of color, you know, and that was a culture of stigma and the racial health uh, care in inequities, basically they, they worsened and they amplified, you know, throughout that pandemic. And uh, we're seeing obviously still the effects of it now. Yeah, and there was some kind of a question of, oh, maybe, you know, there was a reduction of some of that stigma during the pandemic, because a lot of people have more endorsed the fact that it is not unusual that people are going to be struggling during the pandemic when they are isolated, they don't have much of, of these connections with people, and their relationships are kind of falling apart, that there is a new norm to really kind of be more accepting of really mental health challenges and struggles. So obviously uh, we need to be more creative and more innovative when it comes to really public health measures that uh, need to be implemented and, uh, and uh, which basically uh, uh, continue to be uh, very important to look at at this point in time. So scope of the problem, you know, um, let's talk about now, you know, the spatial inequities, putting it all together in a sense, but as I mentioned to you, everything is really kind of intertwined here. And uh, so when we're talking about really racism, it's end up being manifested by unequal distribution in substance use disorder treatment. You know, the minoritized groups, you know, have been historically, and I'll talk about the historical context in a bit, like how we got to really here, how we got to do all these, to see all these racial inequities, you know, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, addressing substance use disorders. So they have been systematically excluded from access to treatment due to a lot of and a lot of racist historical policies, and I'll review that with you very briefly. And um, just to give you an idea about really, uh, in general, when it comes to patients uh, um, with substance use disorders receiving care, we have in 2018, for example, just only 18 percent of people identified as needing treatment actually received it. So we're talking about a highly treatable medical condition, which is substance use disorder, you know, majority, majority of patients who struggle with that do not receive care. In fact, a lot of people end up relying on mutual support groups like AA and NA. For Black Americans, or close to 90% that know who's there or diagnosed with an STD did not seek out or even receive addiction treatment. I mean, this is really kind of in a way 
devastating when you see these, uh, these uh, numbers. And for Black and Latinx group in the US, uh, respectively 90 and 92%, close to 90% diagnosed with an SUD did not receive you know, treatment. And uh, again, what fuels that is the stigma, discrimination, the racism, that uh, really plays a significant role when it comes to the substance use within really the black community, within the people of color in general, and I will discuss that in a bit. I wanna address you know, the biggest also, the, the, the case for the opioid use disorder and medication for opioid use, because we talked about treatment in general for the substance use disorders. And uh, one of the things that I wanna point out here is that have been more and more studies looking at the context of really the opioid use disorders and receipt of medications for opioid use disorders. Uh, the racial disparities have been really huge, very prominent in uh, OUD treatment. And even though we see the overdose that have been rising faster among black than white Americans, and but still, as you can tell from all these conversations, everything that opioid crisis still conceptualized as a white epidemic, which has been obviously fueling more of that really racism. And black patients are significantly less likely than white patients to initiate medication for opioid use disorder, whether we talk about buprenorphine, talk about, you know, methadone, you know, and um, so even, you know, the uh, naltrexone injectable uh, uh, formulations. And uh, in the black patients with uh, opioid use disorder may have half the odds of white patients of using buprenorphine or any opioid use disorder treatment service. And this is also one number that is really important to keep in mind, and I don't wanna overwhelm you with all these numbers, but obviously you got the message here that, but this is really significant, that black patients were 70% less likely from a great, great study, less likely to receive a prescription for buprenorphine at their visit when controlling for payment method, sex and age. So you see how really the racism and the disparity is really manifested. And even when they show up, even in the emergency room, you know, and uh, for let's say post overdose and uh, they have an opioid use disorders, you know, and they, they are really less likely, black patients are less likely to receive buprenorphine treatment or to even refer them or enroll them in a buprenorphine treatment program. This is a study we did among Medicaid enrollees here in Pittsburgh, you know, in Allegheny County you know, the black enrollees were 18.2 percentage point less likely than white enrollees to start medication for opioid use disorders, and we controlled for gender, age, and Medicaid eligibility. And we have really kind of from our study, we have looked obviously at moderators and mediators of that, and we found out that each day in the emergency department or county jail, you know, was associated with a decrease in the likelihood of initiating in medication for opioid use disorder, as well as the presence of a non-opioid use disorder, substance use disorder diagnosis, or even participation in intensive non-medication opioid use disorder treatment. So what is really the point here I'm trying to make is that again, you know, we're, we're, uh, we are really have in a sense, the windows of motivation opportunity. Let's say we have patients, you know, in the county jail where who are suffering you know, from opioid use disorders, and we don't even really consider initiating really the treatment for opioid use disorder while they are in really the jail. And uh, so, and, and, and this is really very disturbing because uh, clearly, you know, that we, this is something that can be really very much addressed by really addressing all these kind of, uh, all the stigma that is related to the stigma and the racial Really, and racism that uh, is really manifested in, in really in our criminal justice system. So, you know, before uh, also what, what has been parallel to the problem with, with really uh, uh, racial inequities when it comes to the treatment, substance use disorder is basically the huge problem that is very much again intertwined really and, and very much connected you know, to the same problem, which is really basically the, the systematic mass incarceration of people of color in the US. And this is really a, a couple of quotations, you know, from uh, Michelle Alexander. Uh, she's an amazing long, long, long time civil rights advocate and litigator. She wrote an incredible book. Uh, it's called The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of uh, Color Blindness. 
and uh, one of the quotes is basically about really the you know the war on drugs that nothing has contributed more to the systematic mass incarceration of people of color in the u.s than the war on drugs and i'll talk about it in a bit and as you see also from the second uh, quotation that every system of injustice depends on the silence paralysis confusion and cooperation of those it seeks to eliminate or control so what what just just uh, this is another really in a way topic of discussion that uh, we we can go on and talk about for uh, for hours and hours is the when it comes to inequities and in rates of incarcerations just to give you a little bit of an idea here these are rates of black and white marijuana possession arrest per 100,000 people look at basically the 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 uh, you know uh, the, the the difference between the white arrest rate versus the black arrest rate and uh, you know one of the things that uh, as you know very well that uh, the uh, cannabis use is equally prevalent among black and white people yet you know a lot of black people are really uh, close to four times as likely to be arrested for possession of marijuana. So how did we really get here? This is the second part of, uh, you know, the talk, you know, and uh, so the, the, these are, this stems from really the U.S. drug policies from way back, you know, and we're talking about really uh, um, the, the first major statute of the highly punitive drug laws was the Harrison Narcotic Tax Act uh, of 1914, which at that time uh, established, was established to regulate the distribution of cocaine and opioids. Uh, interestingly enough, you know, that law basically and subsequent uh, jurisprudence were used to prosecute physicians who prescribe opioids for the treatment of, uh, you know, uh, addiction, opioid addiction. And there was a provision protecting physicians initially, then later on, it, it said that in the course of uh, his professional practice only, which means, you know, that was interpreted as a doctor could not prescribe opiates or the need of addiction treatment. I know this is really kind of an old, really, uh, uh, in a way, uh, uh, policy, but, you know, you can, you can still think of it as early on, it contributed to that conception of risky substance use as a moral or character defect than really a medical condition, than really a disease, and, and was the basis for drug policies that came and stigmatized and criminalized people who are in need for addiction treatment. And then things start really kind of uh, evolving, you know, so we moved from uh, really uh, uh, the, the 1920s, you know, there was a National Prohibition, uh, Prohibition Act, you know, and um, you know, and uh, one of the things, and then the 1937, the Marijuana Tax Act. You know, so it, uh, it kind of, really, all these kind of policies were really kind of more racist policy. I want to point out the one from the 1970s, which is the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act, which was the basis for the war on drugs. And, uh, you know, that law basically consolidated, you know, uh, uh, all these laws uh, around it on manufacturing and distributing of all kinds of it, really including narcotics, hallucinogenics, and also chemical when used to make controlled substances. And, uh, you know, the, the, as you know very well, the war on drugs has been a total fiasco and led up to the mass incarceration, led up to really, you know, uh, uh, more, you know, fueling more of these racist policies, you know, and, and which led up basically more and more to that really policy that the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986, which created the 100 uh, slash one, you know, sentencing disparity uh, for crack cocaine versus powder cocaine. And as we know very well what ends up happening here, you know, so it's based on really the, the, uh, the type of the uh, cocaine that was used, you know, that uh, people were really uh, in, in a way sentenced. And, you know, who, who did that affect? It, it disproportionately affected basically black people. And we've seen these mass incarcerations as a result of that policy. So it, it established this criminal penalties for simple even possession of a controlled substance. You're talking about really minor, really offenses, you know, and uh, these people were having uh, really ended up with really huge sentences, you know, and, um, 
And there was a lot of mandatory minimum penalty for certain federal drug trafficking offenses, which obviously what, what ended up happening created that uh, complete imbalance and, and two tier, uh, tiers of mandatory prison terms that were based, as I mentioned, on the quantity and the type of drug involved in the offense, you know, and as I mentioned, you know, whether crack cocaine versus the powder cocaine. And as you know, more of the white people use the powder cocaine and the black people use the crack cocaine. So how really now, you know, this is how we got to where we got, you know, and, uh, and I know that now more and more of the policies have been uh, anti-racist policies. And as you know very well, recently, there was a total removal of the, of the waiver, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, for prescribing the buprenorphine. You know, obviously we're really moving in the right directions, but the question has been, you know, whether uh, 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 this is gonna be enough to really uh, uh, dismantle uh, that uh, uh, the stigma, the racial inequalities uh, that are seen, uh, you know, um, uh, among uh, people of color and, uh, and, and whether people are gonna have more access to treatment. Are we gonna have more practitioners who are willing to really prescribe uh, and uh, uh, medications, you know, for, for example, for opioid use disorders, you know, uh, and how they're gonna be dealing, you know, with their own biases when it comes to working with uh, uh, people of color. So what can we do to address inequities? You know, these are a few things that I'm gonna mention. You know, obviously this is again, a huge topic by itself, but I wanna really just put it in, few, in, in, a, in a context here where first and foremost, what can we do when it comes to advocacy for changes in drug policies? So first of all, we need to really recognize the economic, physical, and socio-political forces that are driving these policies on a local, state, and national level. Because as you know very well, there are a lot of policies that are on a state level that uh, you know, can be really potentially problematic. You know, in one state and the other states are really more progressive or have more reformed. So again, we need to really kind of look at what's been fueling you know, this socioeconomic, political, as well as the, you know, the, the physical uh, uh, forces that are driving these policies. And a, a hugely important decriminalization of the drug possession, which is, we know very well, major contributor, you know, to the, uh, 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 to the disproportionate arrest and incarceration of people of color. So if you really, uh, you know, criminalize, you know, uh, drug, uh, drug possession, you know, what, what you're doing, basically, you're kind of stopping people from really uh, uh, getting into some sort of a treatment, getting the resources they really need, you know. So again, advocating for decriminalizing drug possession. I mean, the, the question is, and has been debated a lot, you know, uh, there is a big difference between minor offenses versus major offenses. We're not talking about particularly situations, you know, with really drug dealers, you know, we're talking about the people who end up suffering, people of color who end up really suffering are people with really who have been using and buying it to really kind of, uh, 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 to really kind of, uh, because they wanted to use, you know, and they see no other ways of doing it. So we need to end a lot of these racial policies that exclude, that permanently end up excluding people with a drug arrest or conviction from their rights, from their key rights and opportunities. And so how is that done? It's by removing barriers and replacing them with social justice ones. And again, and this has been a, an ongoing fight and we keep doing it over and over, or, or, you know, we keep working on it over and over again. And this is gonna never really basically stop because we're seeing it uh, in, you know, the, we're seeing these racist policy all across the US in different states on different levels. So again, the work uh, is, is not done, even though we have been moving somewhat in the right direction. So it, we have to adopt more pre uh, 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 diversion program that allow people with minor drug offenses, minor drug charges to successfully participate in treatment, you know, in rehabilitation process or other programming without having to enter a guilty plea because what ends up happening, you know, this guilty plea will end up triggering federal immigration consequences too, you know, for a lot of people such as detentions, deportations. So again, you know, what, what we, this requires a lot of that really energy, a lot of that effort, a lot of belief, you know, in, in, in the fact that we wanted to humanize 
you know, these people struggle. We, we, these are human beings who are struggling, who are, who are really suffering, and, and not just them, the, their family members are concerned significant others. So, I mean, if we think about it from really the humanistic approach, you know, what could we do to really change all these policies that have dehumanized people who are struggling with substance use disorders, and particularly people of color, you know, have been really discriminated against and not really uh, uh, receiving the, the appropriate resources and uh, uh, services that they need. So when it comes to treatment issues, moving advocacy treatment, I'll talk about institutional organizational level, you know, and uh, first of all, the culture of humility, when we need to practice what culture of humility and what I'm talking about is this attitude, your attitude, you know, of openness, of respect, of humility, of empathy, of really lo loving kindness, self-awareness, uh, being authentic, non-judgmental, ability to recognize, uh, you know, that uh, patient struggles, patients' imperfections, mistakes, and limitations, as well as your own biases and your own imperfections, mistakes, and, uh, you know, and uh, limitations. And without really that kind of a context of really practicing within a cultural humility uh, 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 you know, context, you know, we, we, we just can't, you know, there is no way we can address any of these really racial inequities that we're seeing, you know, in, uh, uh, you know, in our work, you know, with patients with substance use disorders and even psychiatric disorders. A community with community engagement, a lot of the evidence-based treatment activity should be culturally responsive and tailored. I don't use two words here, you know, the responsive and tailored, even though they are kind of in a way, uh, 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 you know, uh, really, uh, you know, uh, they work together in a sense. And the treatments have to be very much individualized, responsive to the patient's cultural, psychological, behavioral, and social needs. And as I mentioned to you earlier in our study that we did uh, basically here in uh, Allegheny County, is that, you know, also tapping into really addressing treatment issues that happen in the criminal justice system, you know, in acute care settings, acute care facilities, emergency departments, you know, and, uh, you know, jails and prisons where a lot of people, you know, who have opioid use disorders that are incarcerated. It's a perfect opportunity to really increase the use of medication for opioid use disorder and close the racial gap in the initiation of treatment. So we need to do more of that work within the criminal justice system, as well as acute care settings, and Adam has mentioned the emergency department. Two things when we're talking about cultural, culturally responsive uh, 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 evidence-based treatments, we talk about surface, uh, surface structure and deep structure. Surface structure very simply is about what sort of interventions fit within a specific culture and rituals, and obviously it involves always community members and target population. You wanna be out in the community and really get the people's involvement and uh, community activists who, are, who know their community, who know their really people in their communities, who know what their struggles are, who know what, the, what can be done and what could work, you know, what doesn't work. And the deep structure piece is that how you refer to spirituality, religion, the family uh, uh, structure, society, economics, and all the government in general, both in perception, in fact, and how it can influence the target behavior. We'll talk about, for example, the substance use here. So we need to take these two things into consideration. So which leads up to really, you know, cultural adaptation. All the treatments, you know, that we have to really think about, I have to be really more culturally adapted. I want to give you, this is really, you can read that there. You know, this is, um, Bill Miller, you know, the pioneer of motivation interviewing, wrote a seminal paper talking about the why, what, where, when, and how of substance use evidence-based treatment. So there is a cultural adaptation to it. And, uh, and this is really fascinating here that uh, when, uh, when we're talking about really, uh, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, the cultural adaptation of these evidence-based treatment to really address these racial inequities in substance use treatment, we're talking about the importance of what needs to be modified, where and how, you know, again, the why, what, where, when, and how. And if we don't really capture all these kind of elements there, it would really be uh, very much uh, wouldn't work. And we know very well, we don't want to have any kind of really a priori assumptions that interventions that were developed for one ethnic minority group, one, you know, uh, uh, ethnic racial minority group are appropriate for a different one. 
So, and, and this is something that we're struggling with in the field of addiction. They're trying to really, you know, uh, uh, really uh, adapt and really uh, uh, study more interventions that are really uh, uh, focused on not assumption that they, because they work for white people, they're gonna work for people of color or, you know, for um, American Indians, you know, or so. Uh, it's, so again, this is really important to keep in mind you know, that whether we talk about the behavioral intervention or we talk about medication interventions. So just, we have a few of these interventions, you know, that have been responsive and tailored, you know, and uh, like, for example, there's a combination of the motivation to view and community reinforcement approach that uh, uh, was for American Indians and Alaska natives. Substance use disorder is a program, the Imani Breakthrough Recovery Program, that is a faith-based initiative designed to be very culturally responsive and trauma-informed, you know, while assisting black and brown communities who have uh, substance use disorders, and uh, using, in fact, uh, more champions in the community, coaches and groups that were held in the local church. And, uh, and there is also a culturally adapted motivation to viewing that has been looked at in the, uh, also in terms of the context of substance use, uh, of alcohol use and heavy drinking, and that showed that when it uh, considers social stresses and cultural influences, it can have a, a, a positive impact and reduces negative consequences about Latinx. So again, and then there is always, always, always to remember that part, a lot of these recovery support groups, mutual support groups, you know, they can be also culturally very responsive and adapted to really the, the, the population, you know, that they are serving. On an institutional level, you know, that uh, we've been now more and more basically uh, increasing, wanting to do more, more and more to uh, increase the, uh, uh, really the number of specialists trained to provide uh, a marginalized and minoritized population with culturally sensitive and uh, responsive SUD care. You know, we're doing a lot of our training programs now in addiction psychiatry and are really incorporating, you know, in the curriculum more of the, uh, uh, the um, you know, the, uh, the training in culturally responsive uh, care and addressing racial inequities and substance use disorders. There's the REACH program, which is a SAMHSA funded program uh, based at Yale for one year for med students, psychiatry residents and fellows. And, uh, the PAs, you know, who are uh, interested in, who are really basically from an underrepresented group in medicine, who wanted to really be involved in, uh, uh, in uh, getting more training. And, uh, and there's the access also program that is really established in Boston. Just to give you an idea about some of those, we have a grant uh, recently that we got from SAMHSA on training in uh, medication for opioid use disorders for uh, 40 year medical students. And we have incorporated as a part of that a training also a focus on uh, uh, how to address racial inequities in uh, substance use disorders and uh, and all the other aspects that are really connected to it. I just want to leave you with this, uh, you know, a perspective that we wrote in the Counselor magazine on the loving kindness. You know, the, the bottom line here, when you think about really uh, uh, working with patients, I talked about the cultural humility. You know. Uh, uh, we, 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 think, we think more of really how we need to humanize more the work that we do. We need to really work through our own biases. We need to work through our own really perceptions, our own assumptions, you know, and, and without that self-awareness, without that ability also to be empathic with people, genuinely empathic with people and, uh, and believing in their ability to change, you know, and, uh, there is no way we can make any kind of a sort of difference when I'm referring to the loving kindness, which is really kind of a whole of a melange of uh, loving intention and kind action, which can be, which really is what you do in your practice. And what's supposed to be done in practice, you know, uh, in practicing medicine or psychiatry, working with patients and their families and concerned significant others. You know, just want to leave you with that quote, uh, quote from uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's junior, you know, about the fact that it really boils down to this, that all life is interrelated. We are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied into a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects us all indirectly. Thank you.
I think we're good on time. We're doing great on time. Thank <laughs> you very much. That's the way he... So we do have time for questions, uh, uh, both online, if you want to enter your questions, uh, or here um, uh, in the room. If you have questions, please raise your hand. We'll pass the microphone to you. Or any reflections, any uh, sharing, any experiences, you know, uh, challenges you've gone through. I really like uh, your uh, uh, quote on loving kindness as an antidote for um, basically for uh, being culturally relevant, anti-racist in our approach to care. Um, that's something really to reflect on all of us uh, in our day-to-day -day work, uh, really. Uh, while people are thinking about questions, uh, Dr. Duwehi, can you point to specific uh, changes in your curriculum or in your clinical care that uh, happened since COVID uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, uh, specifically to kind of uh, adapt care uh, to be more culturally and uh, racially relevant? Yes, I, I can. Uh, that's a very good question. I can speak about our addiction medicine services, what we have been really doing you know obviously as you know the department of psychiatry here is really huge you know, in a sense it's uh, you know you have uh, services across you know from adolescents uh, children adolescents you know adults you know and uh, uh, geriatric populations you know but in terms of the addiction medicine services since really the uh, the implementation since really we got hit by obviously the covid pandemic and everything even from before you know, when it comes to really the training, you know, the, I'll talk about the training and the practice and, and really what from the clinical the clinical services, what we've also done. But in terms of training, we'll talk about training our residents, you know, our fellows, addiction fellows. We also have fellows, obviously, in consultation years old and geriatric. And so what we have really implemented is more of a curriculum that, you know, it's still the same curriculum, but we've, we've integrated a lot of really basically the racial and ethnic, you know, challenges that are seen in working with patients, you know, their family members and concerns. So we have integrated it in a lot of aspects. There wasn't any kind of like a one particular curriculum that was designed, you know, to really just address that because we thought about it, you know, that if you want to just really, first of all, the, these racial social health inequities are infiltrating every aspect of really of the work that we do. I don't talk about medicine, I'll talk about psychiatry, medicine and psychiatry. So what we have decided to do is that we have incorporated within our curriculum really more specific topics and particularly more uh, case discussions uh, in, in not just lectures. Obviously there is, a, there is a basically the didactic piece of it, but we have always believed that without engaging the residents, you know, the med students, you know, the fellows in conversations. So, and making them feel safe, which is really huge. That has been a big challenge for us because one, the challenge for us was that what sort of a forum we want to provide so they would feel safe to open up and share about also their own biases, their own challenges, you know, and so they can really kind of discuss, you know, so we use the, discuss the case, we use, really the case presentations, but they are used also to really provide some self-reflections on their own practices and how it affects really the patients, you know, but also how it affects treatment outcomes, but most importantly, how they can really build their own identity, if you want to call it anti-racist or, you know, but how can they build their identity, how they can humanize more the way they really work, you know, with, with with patients and their family members so we've integrated a lot of that stuff within the curriculum you know and 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 we've kind of in a sense we've we've really also relied on what we call like champions you know so we had like you know four or five champions within that really uh, uh you know that have really built uh, that have helped build uh, you know curricula before you know and everything so because designing also a curriculum is really a challenge you know, and or really integrating within a curriculum, 
you know, all these aspects is a little bit of a challenge. So we got all these champions that are really very motivated, very driven to really do it from, from again, different backgrounds, different, you know, uh, you know, different experiences, you know, and uh, that help us really integrate more and more into it, you know. And the other thing for the clinical services, for the clinical services, there was a huge initiative from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center to really uh, 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 integrate also within really the, the training and supervision of, you know, the, the staff, you know, of a lot of the addressing a lot of these, uh, you know, uh, okay. inequities. Thank you. Thank you. I have a couple questions uh, online here. I'm going to start with Dr. Mathis. Uh, Myra Mathis is our director of addiction services here at the university, and she's uh, also the uh, fellowship director, um, uh, the, the fellowship that uh, is new and starting, basically. And her question is, uh, well, first she says, thank you for this presentation. Can you speak to strategies to engage colleagues in treatment of addiction? Uh, as you mentioned, the X waiver is eliminated, but some may hesitate to begin prescribing buprenorphine. Yeah, yeah excellent question. So is this the first year you started the fellowship, guys, or you've been doing it for a couple of years? I'm just... There a way to put uh, Dr. Mathis on. Okay. We can put Dr. Mathis on as a... Uh, on screen. On screen, yeah. Yeah, he's ready. Uh, if you want to... If you want to... Uh, uh, Start, uh, Dr. Dwayne. I will try to put Dr. Mathis on as a speaker on the screen to ask directly the question about the fellowship. Yeah. Hello, I believe I'm Hi. unmuted. Sorry, go ahead. You, Myra. Okay, so yes, well, thank you for the opportunity to share. Um, we've actually just been approved by the ACGME in the last two to three weeks, so a brand new fellowship. Excellent, congratulations. Thank you. Great. Uh, so get to your, your question, and it's an addiction psychiatry fellowship, right? It is, addiction correct. Medicine. Addiction okay. psychiatry. Okay, got it. Yeah, you know, uh, so in terms of the strategy, you know, your question about the strategies, how, you know, uh, we can get more practitioners to be more involved. And as you know, the X waiver, you know, has been, I know everybody has been waiting for that to really come, you know, and then so people, uh, you know, would really, so we would see more practitioners really involved in really prescribing. In fact, you know, a lot of really the studies that have been done, as you know, probably, you know, is that uh, it didn't necessarily increase the number or, you know, like a huge number. It's not like, you know, it, 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 the, like the waiver was not a, the only obstacle that was kind of the only barrier that was really stopping people from really engaging and working with, you know, uh, patients with substance use disorder, you know, OUD, you know, and uh, because it's, again, goes back to the points that I really made before. We have a serious major problem uh, uh, among the psychiatrists in general, you know, wanting to really basically deal or work, you know, with patients who have substance use disorders because of their own biases and the stigma. I want to go back to that stigma thing, you know, even if they, it's not always really very pronounced openly, you know, but underlying when you ask people, you know, I have like, for example, trainees who struggled, who had their own personal stories of struggles, you know, in their families and everything. And you see two reactions. One reaction is that I want to be more involved in the field and really do more of the work, you know, that with, with the patients with substance use problems. And you have the other extreme where you have trainees said that I don't want to really touch that. I cannot deal with this, you know, there is no way you know, I can be involved in that. So uh, two things that I think we would wanna first of all do is that be realistic that the fact that, you know, change does not happen quickly and easily. Look at all these US drug policies that have been really the, the racist policies for years and years and years that, that, that still linger, that still, we're still kind of in a sense you know, uh, uh, going through all these consequences of the war on drugs, you know, we're still kind of seeing that. So I think three things, you know, when it comes to the strategies, first of all, we want to involve more people in advocacy. And this is what I do a lot with my trainees, you know, and my residents, my fellows, even medical students, you know, whether you want to do it on the local level, you know, state level, 
you know, and even the national level, you know, so, but also a lot of it, a lot of them are not aware of what advocacy means, what, what it entails, you know, or, you know, and so we try to really help them, you know, make it really uh, simple, you know, as a concept, but how they can be involved, even really small things that they can do that can make a huge change within their own, even their own community. For example, medical students, what, what I've been doing, I have, I've always really identified champions within, you know, the, the support here medical students who helped a lot with my grant, you know, the SAMHSA grant that I have with the training for opioid use disorders. They are really, you know, so they, they have been advocating more and more to really kind of, in a sense, spread the word. And, you know, when we have an addiction, uh, you know, uh, uh, also, uh, you know, AOC, you know, like uh, area of concentration you know, that that helps a lot because I want to, my strategy has been always start with the medical students, starts very, very early on because when they're going to become practitioners and psychiatrists, if they have not been really kind of prepared from really early on, there is no way, I mean, it's, it, it would be kind of somewhat late, but you can still do a lot of really the work, you know, mm -hmm. so I, I mean, the advocacy part, the integration of more a training. I mean, now, you know, you don't, you just read it. Okay. Well, we remove the X waiver now. Okay. Well, what does that mean? That do you don't train people anymore and, and, and really, you know what I'm saying? So how are they going to, I mean, in a sense, you're really putting them in a position where it's an unfamiliar, uh, it's the unfamiliar territory that they're going to be really intimidated by it. And I know that Samson now is coming up in June with some sort of a curriculum, you know, that, uh, on substance use, but I don't believe this is going to be really enough to change people's, to change the culture, you know, so. I, um, I want to, we have a couple of minutes left. Uh, there were two other questions uh, online here. One from Dr. Kane. Um, uh, Dr. Kane is our previous chair of the department. He's asking many community members have expressed concerns about harm reduction efforts as continuing or encouraging addictive behaviors how should we uh, how should these be addressed especially when they don't want to see such services uh, nearby and i have another question after that also yeah well I, well harm reduction is a well established evidence based you know approach that has never really you know showed that it really increases you know substance use or increases engagement in really ris risky behaviors, you know. I mean, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, I didn't have a chance to talk about it here because harm reduction, uh, you know, interventions approach, whichever way you want to look at it, is really one of basically the strategies, you know, that has been implemented as to reduce racial inequities, you know, also in substance use disorders. You know, so it's kind of very much tied to it, you know, and I think we need to kind of in a way debunk and, you know, these kind of myth about the fact that, you know, uh, uh, harm reduction approaches really, uh, you know, uh, lead to people using more drugs or engaging in more risky behavior. You know, this has been an ongoing struggle for for years and years and years, you know. I, th I think there has to be a conversation, not confrontation, you know, because a lot of people can have very rigid beliefs you know, and not, they are not persuadable, you know, <laughs> you yeah, know, easily. This is another you know. round, the war, war yeah. on, right? You, soft on crime, soft on drugs, you have to be strong advocate. Oh, for, yeah, know. I mean, you know, I think you want to show the evidence too. You want to kind of present people with the evidence, you know, with the scientific evidence, as well as really listen to them, you know, about their concerns. This is the same story that happened, you know, with, with the, as you know, with the, but the whole issue with the hesitancy when it comes to the vaccine, COVID-19 vaccine, you know, all these misinformation, disinformation and all this stuff. I mean, there are ways to really deal with it, you know, you know, by by really engaging people more and and having, you know, conversations, not attacking people back or argue, counter arguing, arguing, you know, it's not going to get you anywhere. If I can keep you for just a couple more minutes, uh, Dr. Doi, it's a question from Dr. Holly Russell. Uh, Dr. Russell is a family physician, and she's the uh, opioid steward here in our health system. Uh, she says, thank you for this excellent presentation. I wonder if you have looked at whether efforts to curb opioid prescribing 
have also had negative effects in terms of worsening racial disparities in pain treatment. That's an excellent point. Yes, in fact, this is very, uh, uh, this has been in the work, let's put it this way, because as you know, now, you know, the, uh, you know, for example, in Pennsylvania, I'm not, uh, you know, in Pennsylvania, the, the uh, one of the qualifying condition, for example, of medical marijuana is an adjunctive therapy, you know, for opioid use disorder. So I think, you know, there are more studies now that looked at basically, uh, you know, some intervention, like, you know, for example, medical marijuana as really, you know, replacing, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, people who don't want to go on really the opioids for chronic pain. But the problem is how it fueled more of the racial inequities is that a lot of, for example, dispensaries, a lot of really access, you know, to medical marijuana, for example, you know, is limited for black people, for people of color. So you see how it's all kind of becomes very much of this web of really, you know, everything revolves around, you know, these kind of lack of resources and lack of access to treatment. So we've seen that, for example, particularly because, you know, it is kind of expensive. It's not affordable. They, they cannot have access to it and look at where the dispensaries are, what areas of, you know, so there is, and we're looking at, in fact, you know, one of, uh, my mentees is looking at basically the geographical distribution and changes that happen, you know, as a result of medical marijuana and the impact on the opioid epidemic. So stay tuned. This is really, this is an excellent, you know, question. And uh, yes, but I do agree that we're seeing, you know, more of, uh, of these kind of really, uh, uh, we're seeing it more fueling, you know, you know, the, uh, because it's not, it's again, it's done really for whatever reason, it's ad, uh, creating advantages for certain population, as I mentioned, which is really what racism is about, and, and disadvantages for the people of color. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you very much, Dr. Dewey, for- Thank you, thank you, thank you, George. Can I say one thing? Dr. Maris, if you have any question or anything you uh, uh, about the fellowship and everything would love, really, you can please reach out and have a conversation, anything I could help with. You know, it's, it's great to see that uh, that is really happening there. You know, I mean, we, we need more of these programs. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Take care.